A question that has boggled the minds of all of us at one time or another. Do heavier objects fall faster than lighter ones? Take a bowling ball and a basketball to the top of the Empire State Building and drop them off. Which one do you think will hit the ground first? Despite what you might have seen or what you believe the science says, the actual answer will surprise you and your intuition may or may not be right. I'm Stu and welcome to Debunked, where we sort the truths on the myths and the facts from the misconceptions. Like, subscribe, and leave us a comment now about which ball you think would hit the ground first. Before we go dropping things off of one of the world's highest buildings, let's first take ourselves to a more familiar height, the roof of your house. And from here, we're going to also drop two balls. But to make sure the falling race is fair, we'll use two bowling balls, a kid's six pound ball and our 16 pound competition ball. Because the balls are the same size and shape and the distance to the ground is quite small, we only really need to consider their mass, one heavy and one light. So, which will hit the ground first? The heavier ball feels more eager to drop, right? Let's drop them and see. The heavier ball hits the ground at the same time as the lighter ball. You may be thinking, well, this doesn't prove anything, it's an animation. So, we tried it for real. As you might have guessed, dropping bowling balls from the roof of my house was a logistical nightmare. So here we are for a real life experiment. So, what's happened? Why doesn't the heavier ball hit the ground first as our intuition would suggest? To understand what's happened, let's have a word with gravity enthusiast Isaac Newton. He laid out a few laws of motion. An object at rest stays at rest. An object in motion stays in motion, unless an external force acts on it. This property of all objects is known as inertia and is essentially a resistance to a change in their state of motion. The heavier an object, the higher the inertia, and the more force is needed to change its motion. This applies to all movement, and is why it's harder to move a heavier object than a lighter one. Newton also gave us a law of universal gravitation. This tells us that the more mass an object has, the stronger the gravitational force acting on it. Our 16 pound ball is heavier, so the force of gravity acting on it is stronger. But here's the key. While the heavier ball has a greater inertia and so resists change in its motion more than the lighter one, the increased gravitational force on the heavier ball exactly compensates for this greater inertia. The result is is that both balls, despite their different masses and inertias, accelerate towards the Earth at the same rate, 9.81 meters per second squared. The two balls fall at the same rate and hit the ground at the same time. So, if the acceleration due to gravity is the same for all objects, why, if we climb back on your roof and drop a bowling ball and a feather at the same time, would the bowling ball leave a crater in your lawn long before the feather had finished falling? It's because of the component we didn't need to consider in the double bowling ball experiment. Air resistance. Air resistance, or drag, is an interaction between a moving object and the molecules in the air, and it opposes the downward motion of a falling object. Shape, surface texture, cross-sectional area, and velocity all affect the degree of air resistance an object experiences. A feather has a large surface area relative to its mass, and the fine filaments it's made up of create turbulence and friction as the feather falls. As a result, our dropped feather is subject to a much greater degree of air resistance than our bowling ball, and its descent to Earth from the roof is significantly slowed. Without air resistance then, would the feather and the bowling ball hit the ground at the same time? In 2014, a headline-grabbing experiment took place inside a vacuum, essentially a big room that has had all the air sucked out. No air means no air resistance, which means we're only seeing the effects of the acceleration due to gravity. The experimenters simultaneously dropped some feathers and a bowling ball from the top of the vacuum chamber. And, drumroll please, the feathers and the ball hit the ground at the very same moment. This experiment beautifully illustrates what the science has already told us. The mass of an object has no effect on the rate at which it accelerates under gravity. And without the effects of air resistance, two dropped objects will hit the ground at the same time, regardless of their mass.
Under normal conditions though, that is non-vacuum conditions, falling objects, be they feathers, basketballs or bowling balls, do experience air resistance. And if the height from which an object is dropped is large enough, we need to factor in terminal velocity. As we've already established, the force of gravity causes objects to accelerate. This acceleration in air doesn't continue indefinitely though. For a ball dropped from a height, air resistance increases as velocity increases. And eventually, if the ball is dropped from a high enough height, the force of air resistance, acting upwards, increases until it is equal to the force of gravity acting downwards. At this point, the ball stops accelerating, and the rest of its fall continues at a constant velocity, known as its terminal velocity. Let's get a little more ambitious than the roof of our hypothetical house, and drop some stuff from the observation deck of the top of the Empire State Building. We're keen to drop a basketball and a bowling ball, but the two balls have different sizes and different surface properties. If we really want to know how mass affects the rate at which these balls plummet towards the streets of New York, they need to be the exact same size and shape. So in addition to our regular basketball, let's engineer ourselves a replica basketball with the exact same weight as our 16 pound bowling ball, plus a steel basketball weighing in at a whopping 125 pounds. We've somehow got our basketball, our bowling ball weight basketball, and our steel basketball to the top of the Empire State Building. It's time to drop them simultaneously from the viewing platform. Which one will hit the ground first. Your instinct may be to say the heavier ball, but recalling our earlier observation that a falling object's mass doesn't affect the rate at which it accelerates, you might also be tempted to wager that they'll hit the ground at the same time. But then again, what about terminal velocity? A falling ball's terminal velocity depends on five things. Its mass, its area, its acceleration, the density of the air or medium through which the ball is falling, the drag or air resistance. Only one of these factors varies between our regular basketball, our 16 pound basketball and our 125 pound steel basketball, mass. So how long does it take before each ball hits the sidewalk? The steel basketball won't actually reach its terminal velocity from the height of the Empire State Building, but it will hit the ground first, after a speedy 8.9 seconds, at a velocity of 81.89 meters per second. The bowling ball weight basketball also won't reach terminal velocity from this height, but it will have accelerated to a lower velocity of 61.67 meters per second, and will impact the ground after 10 seconds. The regular basketball will reach its terminal velocity of 19.72 meters per second after 10 seconds, and will eventually reach the ground after a total of 20.7 seconds. This thought experiment illustrates something you might not have expected to see. If neither of the balls managed to reach terminal velocity, why did they not hit the ground at the same time? This was something that baffled us at first. The balls are the exact same size and shape, they have the same surface texture, and they are falling under identical conditions. Surely, we thought, it's pretty straightforward. They fall at the same rate. If they're falling for long enough, the lightest ball reaches its terminal velocity first, and the heavier balls continue to accelerate at the same rate for a longer while. Then once the middleweight ball hits its terminal velocity, the heavier ball overtakes. If none of them reach terminal velocity, they hit the ground at the same time. That's all there is to it, right? To our surprise, as our physics professor explains, it's not quite that simple. For a start, when we're talking about the forces acting on a falling object, we need to think about the object's weight, which isn't quite the same as its mass. Mass tells us how much matter an object is made up of. Weight on Earth is the force exerted by gravity on the object, which results in a falling acceleration of 9.81 meters per second every second, when unimpeded by other forces like air resistance. When an object falls a long distance through air though, we obviously need to consider air resistance. If we consider all the forces involved, we can work out a sort of overall force, known as the resultant force acting on a falling object. 
Time for a quick thought experiment. Imagine a ball falling with a weight of 500 newtons, roughly the weight of an adult ball mastiff, with an air resistance of 3 newtons opposing its downward motion. The resultant downward force would be 497 newtons. Air resistance has reduced the downward force and hence the acceleration of the ball by a measly 0.6%. The ball accelerates at 9.75 meters per second every second until it reaches its terminal velocity. Now imagine the other ball of identical size, shape, and smoothness weighs only 6 newtons, about the weight of a 5-6 to six week old kitten. Under the same conditions, with the same air resistance of 3 newtons opposing its downward motion, we get a resultant force of only 3 newtons, a reduction of 50%, meaning an acceleration of only 4.9 meters per second every second. In our Empire State experiment, the difference in weight values is less extreme, and neither the 16-pound bolt bowling ball nor the steel bowling ball is light enough that air resistance would affect their acceleration quite so profoundly. Over such a large distance though, the effect is measurable. And we can clearly see that the acceleration of the lighter ball is impeded more than the steel ball. And the steel ball would hit the sidewalk first. Whilst the Empire State is high enough to demonstrate a variation in falling speeds, we don't yet know the terminal velocities that these two balls will achieve. So from what altitude would these need to be dropped? Well, our bowling ball weighted basketball would need 36 seconds of falling time to achieve a terminal velocity of 69.17 meters per second. For our steel basketball to reach its terminal velocity of 193.32 meters per second, it would need around 150 seconds of falling time, which would mean increasing the altitude all the way up to 26,000 meters. That's over 85,000 feet. This would mean dropping it from the stratosphere, so we technically need to factor in a whole bunch of other atmospheric changes, like air density and humidity. But for our point in question, this illustrates the physics at play well enough. We've covered a lot of ground in this video, but I think there's a couple of key standout points. I shouldn't be allowed anywhere near the Empire State Building or my local bowling alley. I hope you learned something new. We certainly did. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and make sure you turn on the notifications for our next release. See you next time.